See, she threw all of you out. I was trying to tell her, don't put I'm in for sorry. all. <laughs> okay, let me just see if this works. I'm just trying to see if we can go live because I don't know who would need it later. And you you're, know, you're live, it's going live. Because I just did the twin hearts and it went live. So I'm wondering why that sudden change. They okay, people. Ectoplasm. <laughs> ectoplasm. Let's hurry up. We are live. Yes, yes. We have to hurry up. Shri, uh, Amit, uh, Amit actually wants to finish the class today. Not the class. chapter. Yeah, ectoplasm. Ectoplasm. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's move on really quickly with this ectoplasm that we have. All right. So I'm going to start off with this particular. Which page is this, Amit, for people? As 124. 124, yeah, we're on page 124. Um, apologies for anybody who got disconnected by me. So let's go. As a rule, the placing of any material, material object, why? Nothing. I just had a very dirty thought, but it's PG-30. I just read placing a material object. How is that dirty? Man, we keep talking about this. <laughs> I was thinking in those days, people who are experts at projecting this, the girl will ask, is that your rod? Or are you just happy to see me? <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. I think I'll have to, I'll have to Sorry. stop the recording streaming. again. <laughs> we'll have to stop the streaming with you. Amit, relax. Okay, fine. So, the object, all right? <laughs> so, they say if, if there is this, um, you know, say for example, you're trying to Okay, go on. Levitate the table, <laughs> yes. And there is a rod coming out of the middle of the body, the trunk of the body, going through the legs, oh. yes, and coming out of the toes. I hope there. it wasn't one of your toes. <laughs> it's funny though. Anyways, go on. Yeah, seriously. He, yeah, you're not the excuse. About. He's just using you as an excuse. Yeah, so please I'm forgive me. <laughs> He's crying with laughter. All right. I want to say puritanical in those days. <laughs> All right. Okay, so coming back. So they say when this is happening, the connection, this etheric uh, rod or this etheric cord that is created, you do not place anything in between that. So if there is a material, materialistic object placed there, that gets disconnected. Yes, and so they say if you really have to interfere, and I don't know why anybody would, so they say if you put a thin object like a pencil, right, passing through it in, in, in the vertical sense, then it should be okay. So anyway, basically the point is that you do not uh, place anything to interfere while this process is taking place between the medium and whatever it is that she or he is trying to work with, yeah? Elevating or levitating or whatever it is that they want to do. So to move on, uh, it says that in order to make it possible for the rod to touch, yes, the floor or the table, that the end of that rod should actually literally become dense, uh, hard, uh, to be able to do whatever it is that it has to do. So imagine trying to, in those days, remember most tables were made out of <laughs> real wood, unlike some of the tables today. No MDF. And this, uh, <laughs> no MDF. So they had really heavy uh, furniture in those days. So carrying this, forget us carrying it uh, with, with our hands, uh, with the ectoplasm or, or with this rod would be quite difficult. So that had to become really dense and uh, the process would appear to take some time Yes, it's kind of troublesome according to them. Uh, consequently, the gripping portions of the structure are always kept at the minimum. Now, this gri gripping, uh, I didn't understand this part. Maybe Amit can throw some light. So they say that this gripping by suction, right? <laughs> it's those suckers, man. You know, in the old days, you used to uh, put that uh, no on the window and on the doors and all that stuff. What? Yeah, it creates a partial vacuum. Oh, like those hook thingies. Yeah. <laughs> now, it, otherwise, how will it grip Amit's the table? jokes in the beginning, everything is going in a different. Listen, seriously, I've come back from that. <laughs> but yeah. Okay, so it's gripping with suction. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Uh, so they, what they actually did was uh, the method of gripping by suction was they started to use this clay, and they started to use material like the stockings of women, or very very thin quality to literally try and figure out how this movement is actually happening. Because otherwise they can't see it, right? It's quite invisible. So what they do is uh, they start to demonstrate by using soft clay. And uh, sometimes the suckers uh, can be heard slipping over the uh, surface of the wood. If it's vacuumed, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> or uh, or taking new grips, right? So I think for me, it's either loosening or it's kind of getting steady and getting stuck where it's supposed to be, the soft clay. So uh, they talk about W.J. Crawford, who's taken a lot of photographs. And so when you look at the photographs, it looks quite unrealistic because they've actually used this clay and they've used this wrapping material, uh, for example, like the stockings of what uh, the stockings that women wear. And they've tried to put it there so that if this energy moves because of its eff effect through that material, it might actually show tears or the strands might get stretched and things like that. So they know how it is actually moving. And uh, towards a later part of the, the same chapter, they also talk about trying to use dyes, right? So when the dye moves, uh, as this ectoplasm moves, right? It doesn't realize where it's le leaving like a trail and uh, it kind of tells you where it came and where it exit exited. We showed the course so, Yes, and if you remember yesterday when we were talking about it, I, I'm not sure if Amit or I, I definitely probably read it, uh, so it says that the ectoplasm goes from a certain part of the body of the medium and then returns to a different part, right? So through this tracking, this, this dye uh, tracking mechanism, they're able to then figure out uh, when uh, does it come back and which part. Interestingly, it comes back to the center of the trunk. We covered all that in one paragraph, which we're going to do for three yes, pages. Yes, it's like three pages, but I so, just tried to summarize it. So all the stuff that we read sometimes may not make complete sense to us right now. Um, honestly, it's not going to be useful for any of us. We know what a cord is, especially pranic healers. We know what to do with it. But anyways, uh, this but is it's important to read, to, you know, it's like history. Correct. But remember, there are things that we will never probably even do. I mean, I'm not going to go into a seance. I'm not going to go to a place where someone's going to levitate the table. But it's good to know how the mechanism worked, right? Just like we, we went through chemistry and physics and biology in school, but we really didn't do much with it. I'm still not doing much with it. <laughs> but anyways, uh, but it was, it's good knowledge to have, right? It does help us on and off with certain situations. Okay, so let's go on. So the photographs. So what does he do? Impressions on putty or soft clay produced by impact of the rods. So through that rods, the cords that we're talking about, the etheric cords, uh, using the cl soft clay, they were able to actually figure out what's happened. And now they also use one more. These impressions are often covered with marks similar to the fabric of the medium stockings, mm. right? So, so something similar to that is what's being used for the impression that the uh, rod would have on the clay. The resemblance, however, a superficial, it being impossible to produce such impressions by actually pressing a stockinged uh, foot onto the clay. So if you actually took the stocking, right, uh, with, with maybe even the foot in the, in the stocking, and if you press it against the clay, you wouldn't get the same impression. So they're saying that something else is definitely happening when the ectoplasm and the rod is kind of moving through and creating this, there is a different impression, right? Uh, it's almost a superficial impression that comes out. But definitely nothing that you and I can create by just pressing stockings against clay. The impression made by the rod is much sharper than can be obtained by ordinary means and in such as could be obtained is a fine viscous material with the cup. Sorry? Nothing. Ah, okay. Um, if a fine viscous material were to cover the stock, stocking fabric to harden and then to be pressed on the clay. Right. So if you could have a different material on the stockings and when you press it, that impression might actually become much clearer on the clay. And then when you look at the clay, you'll be uh, amazed at the at whatever has been impressed on it. So coming on, uh, going on, sorry. Further, the stocking marks may be greatly modified. The delicate parts and tracery of the threads may be distorted, thickened partially covered over, broken, or still remaining recognizable as that of the stocking, stocking fabric. So if you look at it... So is it, men also used to wear stockings in those days? No, this is to get it on the clay. So they're using that material. They're talking about the stockings like the one that the medium would wear. We yeah, didn't take medium off the medium men? suit. Huh? Medium all men, women? Men and women. Maybe, or I don't know. Stockings? I don't know. Maybe they put that for experiments on the men uh, who were also mediums. All you, right. can, you can put through the leg, but then eventually, anyway. 
We might still tear it even otherwise. Okay. The French used to wear that, right? The white ones. Okay. So, uh, so to move on, yes, <clears throat> if you look at it, <clears throat> when the stockings are there, right? Uh, when this rod moves through it, it's going to have an impact on the physical material that is there on the clay, which is the stocking in the sense. And several things could happen. Uh, you know, sometimes when you take stockings or you take any thin material, if you press your hand through it, you notice that it kind of opens up like a net. Yes, the mesh kind of opens up, sometimes makes a hole. So sometimes it looks distorted like that. Uh, sometimes it can actually thicken, maybe two or three threads come closer to each other, so it looks thicker. Uh, some of them are broken. And then if you look at it overall, you will still notice that it's the same fabric, but it looks quite uh, weird at that point. The deduction is that the ectoplasm is at first in a state like that of semi-liquid. Yes, so because of its state, which is semi-liquid, it can actually pass through the, the mesh, which is the, uh, the stocking fabric, and create this kind of impression on it. And it oozes, <laughs> oozes through and round the holes in the fabric, and partly set on the outside of the stocking. It is glutinous, right? So, glutinous. Sorry, glutinous like rice, when we talk about glutinous <laughs> rice. Uh, fibrous nature and takes almost the exact form of the fabric. It is then pulled off the, the stocking and built round the end of the rod. So basically that stocking is then moved towards the, if they can actually probably see it in this case, towards the uh, rod itself, around it, around the end of the rod. For a large impression, the skin is thickened and strengthened by the addition of more materializing material and thus the original impression may be twisted, distorted or partially obliterated. Yes, and uh, for me basically they're able to then tell you that this is how this um, rod moves, right, from the medium and goes out. And so if you look at the pictures, it will look like they've got some bandages and put it around some tube. <laughs> so if you go to uh, WJ, uh, Crawford's experimental images, it looks really weird, right? So if you have your phone, if you can pull it out, you will actually see that image. And it looks like a pipe uh, with where, you know, like my son has taken wet paper, tissue paper, and just made, wrapped it around. It looks something like that. Go ahead, Amit, all yours. Um, it's basically just information, so I, I don't have really much to say about this. It's just explaining it. It would be really, really an amazing thing if they would explain how this um, how this rod is made in the first place. I'm getting more and more interested in like even I want to do it. You know, like this, <laughs> I mean, like you know, it, this is materialization. Yeah. So what they're doing is, uh, but it's dangerous materialization where for the last part you're using the actual mediums. This is my assumption now huh? because they, I, I'm going to read this whole thing because this is basically Sumi's read it already. <laughs> Um, there are basically three things that I was wondering. Number one, um, how is this rod generated? You know, the first thing they're talking about is the rod. Uh, and the rod is ectoplasm, but ectoplasm is not a rod. Yeah. Right? So when you want to lift a table, when you want to communicate by tapping on the table, you know, like no one can see you, uh, invisible but tangible, you knock. And then you communicate two knocks for yes and one knock for no. Um, then it's um, then it's a rod made of ectoplasm. But have they said it's made of ectoplasm? We do not know. Um, but all rods are ectoplasm in nature. But ectoplasm is just a shell or material that is used for different purposes. So it will be used to uh, form rods. It could be used to form uh, what do they call um, uh, a shell for the dead to occupy the astral body to get a physicalized body and uh, but the problem is they didn't explain how it's generated and that is very very interesting uh, because um, for example uh, where do where is the let's say psychic what they're talking about the oozing and the thickness you see there's a consciousness happening there's consciousness 
the medium may be conscious or maybe unconscious, but the medium has no idea about energy. The medium has no idea about what is happening in general based on what I've read. I could be wrong. Please, if you guys know, please uh, say it on the chat if you've read about it. My point of view is the medium must not know much about energy or uh, you know, how mm. it works. So, but, but somehow this ectoplasm is used. This, this psychic material is produced and extends outward and has a consciousness to a certain extent because where it becomes needs to become dense, it becomes dense. Where it needs to become thin, it, has, it becomes thin. Where it needs to uh, make a suction because otherwise you can't lift a table without a grip, right? They don't have thumbs. So it, it, it grips onto the table using a suction mechanism or a vacuum uh, concept. Now all this requires intelligence, don't you think so? It requires a certain degree of consciousness. So whose consciousness is this? Is it the chakras of the medium? Is it the entity? Are there beings in the room? Um, so, and uh, who takes it out? Who sustains it for that time? All right. Uh, uh, and who uh, initiates, as you can say, the formation of the ectoplasm for the dead to occupy? Who initiates the shell? Right. So that is, these are certain questions. Um, the idea is, uh, and what is the material? What is it actually made of? Yes, it's glutinous, fibrous, but where did they get this from? My point of view is, and you'll read uh, because of the muscle uh, and the bone density reducing and the muscle atrophy and these kind of things, in order to physicalize the actual, probably the uh, life energy of maybe even the medium is used. So we have to see how long how these mediums live, uh, whether they live long lives or not so long lives. And uh, maybe their life force or more than that, certain amount of life energy was consumed to create these uh, shells because to get things from the uh, higher world, from the astral physical, you need a physicalizing object. And this glutinous stuff is probably made of uh, actual, um, uh, you know, tissue. And one of the doctors, I forgot the name, uh, they actually deduced that it's made of, they did experiments and all, they, they said it's, it's, it has got tissues and stuff like that. So that's, that's all I wanted to say because it's something to think about. See, in, in study, you don't always get all the answers. But having questions is good. Number one, it keeps you humble because you know that you don't know everything. And you haven't understood everything. You haven't understood everything. No one does. Um, and number two, tomorrow, if you read another book and you get this answer, you'll notice it more compared to if you had not read this book and had no idea. So you might connect the dots and say, wow, maybe they're talking about what I read in that book and this is how it's done. So then you are deepening your knowledge. So far, I've not found really an answer to this. No, I don't think so. I'm not so interested, to be honest, to find out the answer. <laughs> and I need the experiment, you know, uh, guinea pigs to produce rods and uh, uh, ooze ectoplasm. <laughs> <laughs> and after the... We'll do it distantly, Amit. Huh? We'll do it distantly. <laughs> and also, what they're saying is, um, one confusing part was when they're saying that you cannot interfere with a portion may cause the physical injury. When they're talking about the rod, there was a story in uh, Bishop Ledpeter's book where he attended a seance uh, initially when he was, you know, more skeptical about it. And the whole table got lifted and he says there was no mechanical device underneath lifting it or there was nothing underneath that I could see. So these rods may be invisible, but tangible. But what he did was he, he swished his leg, according to him. He says, I moved my leg all under the table to check whether, obviously the table is there, you're going to naturally move your leg around to see is there some guy, you know, in the darkness trying to push the table or is there a mechanical lever that's happening, you know? Maybe it's like, a, you know, those foot pumps, you pump it and it goes up. So he was trying to check. In that case, he would have definitely disrupted the interference of the rod, but in that time, nothing happened. So what happened in that story compared to what I read here, there's a slight conflict. Uh, so that's, I'm just, I have to still think about it. I mean, because I think maybe the ectoplasm or the rods that go, they go to the legs. They don't go through the middle. So if he puts his hand there, there won't be an. I mean, but he's his leg sitting there. at the end, right? Yeah, but even if he puts his leg, he's he's going to move only through the center unless he pushes it. No, to there the are side. two ways, right? One is the mushroom approach. Yeah, but from the leg to the mushroom. Um, approach, no, mushroom no? goes from the center. I've no, seen a mushroom see. what? No, I'm talking <laughs> about the legs being the stem of the thing, and then it blooms up. I don't know. I no, it depends on the table. Not all tables have legs at the edges, you know. So. And I think it's not that when it gets lifted for me, uh, the the rod or the ectoplasm around it goes with it up. 
right? It's not that it's going to leave a tail down. No, but if you remember so carefully from the last chapter, it, it anchors onto the floor and then pushes up like cantilever. Remember all that stuff? Yeah, there are two types. Yeah, both types. The cantilever would be maybe also, but it would have gone high enough. It mm. won't stay down. Okay. If so, it needs to go up, anyway, that lever would That, that was down. interesting. So maybe that is true. So, okay, go on. All right. So the next one is they're going to talk about the fingers. So they say they can also get the impression of the finger. However, the finger is not the way it looks for us. Naturally, the size whose, of us. Whose fingers? They didn't say whose fingers. They just said finger impressions. Right? So I'm not, I'm sure it's not definitely the person who's um, not in the physical body. So I'm not too sure whose finger impressions, obviously. But they do say that these are different in size from normal ones. So I'm assuming they are either giant size or really tiny. And they say that uh, maybe much more clearly and regularly cut than would be possible with ordinary finger impressions. So when that impression of the finger goes onto that clay, you know, the... the it's in 4K uh, definition. 4K definition. Not the... Uncle what do you Tacham, call those, uh, ink those 3D printers? Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. those 3D printers. Maybe that's how they got the 3D printers. So, you know, even if I look at my own, I can't see all of it very clearly. But the impression uh, probably on the soft clay is much clearer and sharper and mm -hmm. probably bigger. It's almost like, in, for me, if they're saying it's sharper, then obviously it's slightly bit more magnified. You can actually see all the uh, crevices and, and all the depths of uh, the entire impression of that finger. Now, when it comes to the wrapping, uh, when you talk about the tapping uh, and ranging, the, the tapping being as light as something very soft, like a knock on the door, to a sledgehammer uh, that is used to kind of create a sound they say all these other sounds are produced by what is called semi-flexible rods so these rods are not you know stiff they they can actually move uh, at the same time they say with suitable uh, prepared ends being stuck against ma the materialistic object right so uh, now this could be two ways remember depending on the weight of the object that they want to move it could be either the first method, uh, which is basically the uh, cantilevers, or it could be the second method where it is the rods attached to the ground and then uh, moving up. So that anchoring one is the second. So let's move on. The production of wraps is accompanied by the decreasing of the medium's weight, right? So this, we're coming back to the weight again. So the amount of decrease may be close to about 20 pounds or a little bit more. Uh, being apparently directly proportionate to the intensity of that wrap. So if it's a soft wrap, it would be obviously uh, a different impact compared to where you want to create a sledgehammer effect. So that would require a lot more energy out of the, uh, out of the medium. The reason is apparent, the rods being <clears throat> formed of matter of the medium's body, right? So it's coming from the medium's body. The shrinking of such matter, uh, sorry, the striking the striking of such matter on the flow, etc., uh, necessarily transfers some of the medium's total weight through the rod to the flow. Yeah, and so that's why she kind of loses her weight. So most of it is used through the medium to go down there and get this, you know, table off the floor, whatever it is that uh, she's trying to do. And the law, luckily, this loss of weight is only temporary. As long as that condition continues where she's levitating the table, uh, she loses this weight. But after that, it comes back, yes? Uh, so that, that is kind of good for her. The, it restores the material back uh, off the rods and returns back to the medium. Hmm. The production of wraps causes a mechanical reaction on the medium. Uh, so what happens is when this is occurring, there are certain uh, physical movements in her body, right? So for sitters, it's jerks. Uh, but for her, it's like someone pushed her back, like she was struck back. So she moves differently, whereas the, the sitters who also contribute in, in a different instance, uh, part of their energy, they have jerks, right? So that process also happens. So we're coming to that. So at this point, uh, the mechanical reaction is like she's being pushed backwards or struck. This reaction may cause her to, slight, uh, to make slight motions with her feet as well. So that's that striking motion. The stress on the medium, however, is nothing. Uh, like that caused by the levitation of the object. Yes, so hopefully that means less stress for her. However, heavy blows, right, like the sledgehammer, produced by a large rod, are not usually delivered quickly. <clears throat> Light taps, however, are produced by two or more thin rods and uh, may be produced by incredible rapidity. <clears throat> the operator 
appearing to have great command over the rods. Who so, is the operator, the medium? The medium, yes. Yeah. So they keep shifting between these two words. I presume they're the same. So the operator with tiny rods is able to create light taps, which is easier. Uh, however, the heavy rods uh, will not be delivered that quickly. It might take a lot more of his or her energy to come out to create something that's that dense enough to be able to kind of make it like someone just hammered your table at that point. Yes, um, in general, production of these phenomena throws uh, stress on all the sitters. So remember, there are times where whether it is medium with sitters or only medium. There are two types, right? So this is with the medium and the sitter. Uh, the stress is also on the sitters, as is apparent by the spasmodic jerks. So remember I told you they have this, uh, this kind of jerks that happen sporadically probably, and sometimes quite severe. So sometimes it's just light jerks, sometimes it might be you know, a shaking and people are wondering what's happening, uh, which go round the whole circle previous to the levitation. So before the levitation process, takes place, the medium goes through it, its own, like being struck back, and the sitters who give additional material to the rod to get the table moving will start to jerk. So I think the process of jerking or the being struck back is where the energy from the medium or the sitter is being now transferred via the rod to the uh, physical or materialistic object, right? So that process shows a sort of uh, movement of the body jerking or being pushed back for the medium. Now, once that's done, then the table actually moves up and then they, they don't shake anymore. It would appear that the process of loosening and removing etheric matter from the bodies of the sitters takes place in jerks. Oh, here it is. And to some extent, affects them all together, right? So everyone's seated around the table as their energy is being released out uh, for this particular seance or levitation. It starts to manifest in the physical body as jerks, yeah? Okay, Amit Dar. <sighs> I'm trying to finish. I'm just joking. Go ahead, Am. Now, what's interesting is that the, um, the weight reduces, but reduces temporarily. Now, we all know energy has weight, right? We did the experiment, right? No? I, I don't know. I've done it in so many places. I don't know if I've done it with this group. You can ask them. Um, Anyway, so look, if you have an emotional issue and then that emotional issue is resolved, you feel relaxed. It, people actually use the word, the weight is off my shoulders, right? So energy has weight. We don't have time to go into the experiment of this, but there is a way to validate this. And many of you know me, we've done it so many times. Um, then, um, so what is happening is a certain amount of, um, I don't know, very etheric, almost physicalized, and I'm sure physicalized matter is extended out of her body, but still attached to her body, because you have to understand energetic is, energy is fluidic. It's like water, it can flow, right? So it can stretch. So it stretches out of her body. During that time, her physical body might have less weight. Um, and then once it comes back, the weight is restored. So now well, the question is, how do they initiate the physicalization process? Because they've not uh, explained some of these things. It's very, very interesting actually. Is it, I wonder if there's a physicalizing element to get this done, like a crystal, metal, or something that they use to start this externalization and materialization process. I'm sure there must be, because uh, uh, it's just not given here, because some of these things are secret. If they give you everything, then people will be producing rods everywhere. <laughs> So, All right. Sorry. Uh, just to go back to uh, Shristi Gupta. Uh, Shristi, there is the online book as well. Uh, but if you can get your hands on a physical book, it's good. Maybe someone could give you a link right now on the chat so you can go there and access it. Uh, we are in, uh, in chapter 24, page 120. Yeah, good luck. There are 41 videos. 120, I think. <laughs> 126. The book now. <laughs> yeah, but you can, you can listen to it. You don't have to pre-read this before you come. We are reading it at this point and trying to uh, have a greater and deeper understanding of it. Of All course, right? I would suggest it's always better to read a little bit before you come so you can think about your point of view before we give ours. Uh, there is a free version on the uh, internet that you could go to, but we recommend if there is a possibility to try and buy the book. So they 
the Theosophical Society actually gets some royalty. Yeah. So could if you're some, in a hurry, you can. Yeah. Could just, someone put the link there for them, please? Thank yeah. you. Uh, if you can, yeah, you can. Then later on, you can buy it. It's a few hundred rupees. It's fine. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Um. You're talking about the road and the. Yeah, something came to me and I forgot. I'm sorry. I just oh, to no, I forgot. It wasn't urgent. Because the whole process of how it's done, you see the process of how it's done is very secret because it can be misused. It can be really misused, this technique. Um, here it's fun to show that uh, there's something that you cannot see that exists. But if you actually know these techniques, this can be misused. So I don't blame the author for not revealing it. Otherwise, uh, that picture of, or that video of Marilyn Monroe would say, oh, those are rods lifting her skirt. <laughs> Not the, anyway. Um, <clears throat> in general, the production of these uh, throws stress on the sitter, apparently by spasmodic jerks, sometimes quite severe, which go around in circle. That is normal. That proves to me that energy is flowing out of the body. When energy flows out of the body in force, it causes the whole physical body to react. And I'm sure many of you who've done meditation have observed that when there are blockages in your system uh, and the divine energy comes down, your body jerks during meditation, especially meditation on twin hearts, which has a flushing effect, right? So your physical, although it's just an energetic meditation, your physical body jerks, right? So when the, when the, energy, when the person's uh, energy is pulled that way, there might be a jerking sensation. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. Unfortunately, they have not revealed the secret in this book. So we cannot talk about how this is done, no? Uh, that I know, I have no idea. So in general, the production of these phenomena, I have a guess. It would appear that process of loosening and removing etheric matter from the bodies. Here, see, it mentions, it would appear that the process of loosening and removing etheric matter from the bodies of the sitters takes place in jerks and to some extent affects them over. You're not really uh, uh, removing it. You're just transferring it for temporarily because if you remove it then the weight will not be restored that's my idea and that's why you probably need a certain number of people for a seance because one person if they take all of it the aura will be completely detached the person will die <laughs> or i don't know what will happen to that person because if you remove a certain amount it might not go back in the right way <laughs> And the right you know, the right it's person. like sometimes if you demold something to mold it back is a bit complicated by force, you know. If you know what I'm talking about, it won't fit. You know, sometimes... What? It's like taking different dry ingredients and putting it in a bowl. It's very difficult to then give the same ingredient back to, you know, the respective bowls. From and the if it's just one person, if you take so much out like that, you extend it, they're coming back. I don't know, the aura which was here might be on your <laughs> armpit. And some other part might be somewhere else. It was like when I was a kid, I used to remove from the cassette um, player the. You remember the songs they used the to. Booklet inside. They used to have a booklet inside with the lyrics, so I used to read that. But I could never put it back in. I'd end up breaking the. the thing. I'd just leave it there. Because <laughs> it was my brothers and sisters. So. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. What else? I, I, I didn't. Know. Yeah, I covered everything. What else? You have to talk about it now. All right, so let's go on. So now coming again back to W.J. Crawford, reports that an entity uh, supporting to have been whisked alive. Purporting. Um, purport, what is purporting? I have no idea. Can you tell me what purporting is? To have been whisked alive a medical man and so to speak through the medium. And so he gives... Appears action. to do something. Okay, he Especially appears freely. to do something freely. Especially free. Not okay, under... Especially free. So some, somebody is trying to do something. Now, in this case, this gentleman says he's a medical person and wants to give us some information. And so he, interestingly, he actually talks about two options from what I remember reading. So let me just look at that. A dead so, doctor. Yeah, a dead doctor on this occasion in trance for the purpose. Okay, stated that there are two kinds of substances used in the production of this phenomenon, right? So this medical doctor, or hopefully we have a medical doctor here. If Dr. Sagar is here, please uh, validate disappear. what he's saying. Yes. Uh, all right. So let's see. So he says one is taken in comparatively large quantities from the medium and the sitter, all or nearly all being returned to them at the close of the seance. So in this, there is no loss of weight, for example. Right. So whatever energy is taken out 
from the medium and the sitters goes back to them completely, causing no issues for them at any point. However, in the second one, the other can be obtained only from the medium, right? No sitters are involved. This was also mentioned earlier in, in the seance, right? So um, there is only the medium. And as it consists of the most vital material from the interior of her nerve cells. Now remember the energy there, which is part of the nerve cell and the nervous system, is very crucial for the transmission of communication between the physical etheric body and uh, towards the astral and mental. And then astral and mental information coming through, if I remember it right from the earlier chapters, coming into our etheric brain and our physical brain. Now, when the nerve cell's energy starts to reduce, it will affect the person. So here, her nerve cell energy is actually then released out. Yes, it can be taken only in minute quantities without injury to the medium. So the amount of nerve cell energy that can come out has to be considerably less. Otherwise, she or he can get affected. The medium can get affected. Its structure is broken, right? So once this nerve cell energy is coming out of the medium, uh, for the particular phenomenon that is created, the seance or whether it's uh, to levitate the table, at this point, uh, since it's been used, the composition of that nerve cell energy is completely uh, destroyed. And so it cannot come back to her, which means she actually loses that minimal amount that she has released out. Yes. So it says that uh, the structure is broken up by the phenomenon and therefore it cannot be returned to the medium. This statement has not been verified or confirmed in any way and is given purely on its merit. So this is based on what's happening. Now, interestingly, later on, they also talk about the medium's body. I'm wondering if it comes here or later. Okay, let's talk about it. Looks like we're going to the staining process. Remember, I spoke about the dye earlier, and we spoke about how they try to trace the movement of this uh, rod and ectoplasm. So this is where it is. Uh, do you want to say anything about the previous paragraph mm -hmm. before I go into the staining method? Not yet. I have something okay. to say, but I'll say it all together. All right. So coming back to um, uh, Mr. Crawford. So he comes, he has this very successful method, which he calls the staining method that he start to, starts to use to try and trace the movement of ectoplasm. Yes. And so what does he do? He actually basically uses powdered carmine. Remember Amit mentioned about it, red color, right? Like a maroonish. Yeah, maroonish red, if I remember from the earlier chapter. So basically, they're going to use this. Uh, so the ectoplasm possessing the property of adhering strongly to, uh, to such a substance as powdered carmine, the latter is placed in its path. Yes, so you know that the ectoplasm will probably go this way towards that object. And so uh, the powder is placed in its way. So as it moves, we would know how it's actually uh, to trace its path, basically. And so when a color track will be found, that's basically how they know that this is happening. Uh, by this means, it was discovered that ectoplasm issues from and returns to the lower part of the trunk of the medium. Yes. So they were able to then trace that this ectoplasm actually did return. And that's why in the earlier part of this chapter, they say that it does come back to the medium. And so in this experiment, he was able to say and conclude uh, consistently several times that this actually happens. For it was a strong tearing action on the stockings and other clothing and will sometimes pull out whole threads, right? Several inches long from the stocking. So this would happen several times. So when it's coming back, it literally pulls out uh, the strands of thread from the stockings, showing that it's actually moving towards that part or entering that. It sounds so creepy. Part. You should look at the pictures. They look quite creepy too. Yeah. And uh, will sometimes pull out whole uh, threads several inches long from a stocking, carry and deposit the same in a vessel of clay placed some distance from the medium speed. Yes. So uh, that is the interesting part of this movement using the dye. Now the next one is actually uh, the what happens in the in the feet and the legs and the and the shoes of this lady, I presume it's a lady because uh, of what they write. Okay, so the ectoplasm follows a path down the legs. Yes, the down the legs of the person, the medium, enters the shoe, passing between the stocking and the shoe, wherever there is space. So the ectoplasm is trying to get out, right? So it's going to find whatever space it can to leave the uh, physical form. 
if it has picked up dye on the way, it will deposit this basically between the shoe and the stocking where there is no longer any space. The dye gets stuck there. It cannot move, right? So it says that on its way, it will deposit this at any place where foot, stocking and shoe are in close contact, are so close that there's nothing much. That means where there is not sufficient, not sufficient room for it to pass. Yes, so they're very close, they're literally compact, and so it cannot go, and then the dye there remains, you know, parts of it will remain, showing that this is where it was trying to exit or uh, move Why out. you couldn't skip the stockings and just not, not wear shoes? In those days, everybody did. It's like telling you not to wear underwear. Okay, yeah. <laughs> shoes that is It's like important that. for them. No, they had to wear those. Maybe their shoes weren't so great as ours. So you had to wear Pretty something good. to protect your skin. Probably. I don't know. I don't remember that. <sighs> Vijay, thank you so much for putting that information and uh, Chantani as well. Chantani. Yeah. Yes, also many oh, of them you. were... That very, is true. Yeah, Europe was cold. Parts of America was cold. They enjoyed India so much that they stayed for so long. <laughs> Please continue. Without stockings. <laughs> Without stockings. <laughs> I'm sure they had to take off their stockings. <laughs> you know, there was this one time I went to Cochin and they had this Bogati palace or something. And uh, they, they assumed that I was coming with my whole family, which I never do, uh, for the retreat at that point. And so they gave me this huge room and I was wondering, what is this room? And they said, no, no, you know, those days, these, I don't remember who they mentioned, the Lord or whatever, used to stay there. And the room is huge. I would say it's, it's probably half the size of my house right now, just the bedroom. And then it had this walking area and then this huge bathroom. And uh, so they would say that these, these people who stayed there in those days, they would have these very heavy dresses, right? <laughs> heavy and huge. And that, don't forget that huge thing that comes out like, uh, uh, and, and so they would wear these clothes and they couldn't wash them. So they would actually smell, right? And sometimes when you're sick, that the stuff remains in the clothes. And so that's why they, they invented perfume to kind of offset the stench and the, and the strong odor that comes out of those clothes. So I think I'm so glad I'm in this place in the new century where we know how to wash our clothes and we wear light clothes. You know, not crazy clothes where if you're sweating after our exercises, after our hatha yoga, you can come back and actually change and go back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go ahead. Uh, sorry for that. Okay. So the shady part of the ectoplasm. <laughs> um, I already showed this yesterday. We discussed it. I showed you a quote. Uh, I can show it again later. Um... What? What happened? You did the carmine and then you did the staining. That's it. I didn't talk about the, the solidification. You didn't talk about the solidification? Even. That's the next part if I have time. Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to stop. Not sufficient room for the cars. Yeah, that's it. But it's still <laughs> scary. It wouldn't have been, it would be, you know, really amazing to be at a time where you could. Uh, um, you could see some of the stuff, like, I mean, just temporarily, you know, I, it's pretty interesting um, to see, you know. But I mean, is the medium in control of it? Like if you're sleeping next to a medium, your wife is a medium, uh, would the ectoplasm in the night, like, you know, sneak and uh, suddenly you'll see a face or something like that? I don't know. You should see the stories. Um, there was a question about... While scanning, uh, Balachandra, uh, while scanning, cords. we Correct. feel some cords which stay with us even when we cut and clean and it's much thicker. What type of cords are there? They are uh, cords. <laughs> They're still cords. Uh, but um, I hope you're saying unauthorized cords. You do not want to cut authorized ones. Yeah. Like from to your parents. To your children, your spouse, your spouse. siblings. Although sometimes you might want to, <laughs> you don't do that. Um, and sometimes it depends. It's a very vague question. It depends if it's a malicious cord or if it's a older cord. Like if you are sexually interacting with someone for a longer period of time, or you have an ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, uh, there was sexual uh, interaction. The cords are quite thick, and the cords are quite strong. 
unless they were immediately cut off, which obviously people won't do because they don't know they exist, right? So later on, they cement and they anchor. Um, so that is one. There could also be malicious cords. So if you're following the instruction in Possible Miracle and you're sending it to the aura of the closest uh, mosque, temple, church, um, that like attracts like. So that type of energy will be rejected by that type of, uh, this is my assumption, um, by that type of um, place and the cord will come back. Uh, we have experienced this in healing twice or thrice. And in that case, it had to be sent back to the Ajna. And sometimes the cords, because it, it's involving emotions and years and thought forms. So the cords are almost like barbed wire. They're, they're actually really in there. So it requires more skill to take it out. Okay. Yep. So I'm going to read this one paragraph and we'll end with this. Yeah. The solidification as well as the dematerialization of the hard end of the rod is effected immediately. The rod issues from the medium's body. For this reason, the free end of the rod, unless it be one of the thinnest, cannot penetrate closely woven clothes as even wire net or even wire netting, net, of netting one, of inch, one net. inch mesh. Oh, okay. I, I missed that. Uh, if placed more than an inch or two in front of the medium, if such screens, however, are very close to the medium's body, an imperfect materialization of the end of the rod may take place and limited psychic phenomena may occur. So the medium has been naked? <laughs> They're not naked. I've seen these. Uh... No, no, no. They, they're wearing their normal clothes. And what do they mean? The solidification as, as well, well as, as the, the dematerialization of the heart and the rod is affected immediately. The rod issues from the medium's body. So I think the solidification... It, it gets uh, the disintegrated rod becomes, immediately. Yeah, the solidification is where it becomes dense. Yeah. Yes, uh, and or maybe dematerialization. I'm not sure if it also means invisible, where it's no longer physically uh, no, seen or touched. Physical. Yeah, uh, of the hard end, right? That's the one that gets solid. Uh, of any rod can get affected immediately if this occurs. And the reason is... Uh, the free end of the rod, unless it is one that is the thinnest, yes. Uh, so the free end of the rod, which is not connected, I presume, to the uh, to the medium, but the one that's going out, extending, is thin, cannot penetrate uh, closely woven clothes or even uh, the mesh. Now, the mesh, the net mesh, uh, which we're talking about, is a material. I presume they didn't have plastic, definitely there. So it's either metal or some other thick material. So for uh, a thin rod to go through that seems to be difficult, but I'm not sure why, because the um, ectoplasm can go through stockings and clothes and they, they ooze through. They mm. ooze. So, so, okay. So maybe the reason why the ectoplasm can move because it's semi-liquid like, right? And so it can move through, you know, it glides and, and kind of finds its way. Whereas it, when it's solid, it's like a needle. And so if you try and put a needle here, it, it just gets stopped when there's something a bit more, uh, concrete or solid in front of it. So that's my understanding. I could be completely wrong. So the reason that um, the free end of the thing, unless it is one of the thinnest, so if it's a needle like very, very thin, maybe it can go through the clothes. But if it's thick and it is solid, it might find itself difficult to pass through something like even a mesh. If placed more than an inch or two in front of the medium. So if it's very close, then that's as far as it goes and it gets stuck. So one inch, so it comes out of the medium and then gets stuck at the mesh itself. In such uh, screens, however, sorry, if such screens, however, are very close to the medium's body, then materialization uh, and the uh, impact of what she or he is supposed to do in the seance or the levitation of the table probably gets uh, hampered and cannot be done, uh, I would say, successfully. Yes. So the point is, uh, as long as it, it is fluidic, remember even the rod uh, to do the tapping, it had to be semi-flexible, right? It couldn't be uh, completely solid. So that's my understanding. So as long as it's fluidic, it can move through and come. Uh, when it is made dense for whatever reason, then that density, unless it's super thin, like, uh, like a really, really tiny needle, then it might pass through something that's uh, between, for example, clothing, right? So if it's closely woven, it can come through. Otherwise, it's not possible. Sure, whatever they say, this information. 
Yeah, so we have about a page. Uh, we have two pages or so left, and then we have about three pages for the next chapter. So like I said, I'm hoping this week we can finish. So Friday, we should finish with chapter 24, ectoplasm, and then we just have conclusions. So maybe another two sessions next week, maximum three sessions, uh, or we can have the last session as party time. <laughs> so we can just finish with everything. And if there are any questions, if we can answer, then we'll do that. So I think by next week, we should be done with uh, our book. And you guys have actually <laughs> oh, survived. Finally, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I won't have anything. Right, you survived. There, there, there is a, definitely a, a great commitment by all of you. And yeah. we really, I mean, we admire that, that you've been coming literally every day the, that we have the session, three times a week for almost, what, June, July, August. It's going to be almost four months. So congratulations. Thanks for being with us. And we'll end the session for now. Yep. And uh, let's go ahead. Yep, so let's close our eyes, connect down to the palate, inhale and exhale to the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chow Cox, we love Maha and Guruji Mary, to all the great ones, to all the invisible and spiritual helpers, healing ministers, healing angels, the great beings of knowledge, light and wisdom, of theosophy, the great masters and teachers especially, to all the beings present with each one of us, to all the beings of communication, our respective Wi-Fi's, our internet connection, to the great beings of education, to our soul and divine self. Thank you for your great, great blessings, for your light, for your love, for your tremendous patience with us. Thank you for helping us gain greater clarity, greater understanding. Thanks to every person here in this group, now and those who will continue to join us. May we continue to be enlightened with greater clarity, with greater discernment, to continue to have clearer understanding of this priceless teachings. Help us to absorb and assimilate it and use it to become better instruments to do your work. With thanks and in full faith. So be it. Thank you, everybody. See you guys. Yes, and uh, to everyone who's been helping out with this. Uh, thank you, Aditya and Banumati. Much love. And that's yeah. that. Yeah. So we've end the session for today. I'll go out stop live session you're most welcome everybody thank you priya thank you uh, rocky i hope rocky you were able to go back uh, if this is rocky mithal if you've been able to go back to uh, vimeo it it is working so you still have a couple more days to look at it and and do what you require yeah thank you everybody else seema chandani shilpa ekta bindu i'm going to miss people <laughs> i won't be able to see everyone all right so everyone who's typing there thank you I appreciate, we appreciate it. Yes, Ujwala, uh, Manisha, thank you all for what you've given us. Yes, the time, your time. And we've all learned together, right? Without you, both of us wouldn't have gone this far <laughs> uh, with trying to understand and get things. I would have skipped ectoplasm. <laughs> yeah, he would have. Definitely he would have. Sumana also, thank you so much. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bon appetit. And uh, see you on Friday. We Bye. meet at the same time. Arhatik Yogis tomorrow morning. In a breath. Bye. Atma Namaste. Bye. Bye.